Young Ray Ray. A year to the day he would become the Super Bowl MVP. Oh, God. Aww. One year later. Man, that's... Killing a man to... Killing Super a program, man. right. Wow. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. Uh, Billy Embody covers recruiting for On3. He's a great resource. You can talk to him about a lot of stuff, including basketball, which we will get to. We had a recruiting question come in from one of our listeners that we'll get over to Embody that we welcome into the conversation now. Billy, good morning. How are you? Oh, no. Oh, one second, Billy. One second. It's our fault over here. We were doing a little voicemail. We should have you now, Bill. You there? I'm here. Oh, yes. Crispy <laughs> clear. Uh, good morning, Billy. How are we? Okay, so we're in this second part of this recruiting swing with a national signing day coming up here in a couple of weeks or uh, uh, coming up the first week of February. Walker Howard news hits yesterday. Your reaction is what? I think in the end, somebody had to go, um, you know, whether it was Garrett Nussmeyer or Walker Howard, somebody was going to say, you know what, this isn't the best situation for me long term uh, to, to get the amount of playing time that I need to get the amount of reps that I need. And I think that's what it came down to. You know, I, I do think that uh, depending on what happens at Ole Miss uh, with their quarterback situation, a lot of rumors flying around on that front, you know, we could look back on this one and, uh, you know, quite frankly, laugh. Uh, in terms of just how it worked out from a depth chart perspective over there. But I think for Walker, I mean, the best opportunity for him to get on the field uh, sooner rather than later was to go elsewhere. And um, that, you know, that was just the reality of it. I'm a little surprised he didn't end up at TCU with Jack Besh, but um, to play in the SEC and to play for a guy like Lane Kiffin, uh, who's known for, you know, being able to get some high scoring offenses out there and, and certainly some buzz around his quarterbacks. Um, it's a good fit uh, and, and not too far as well for him. Uh, you know, just that whole SEC mindset that you know, they kind of have. Billy, you cover sports around the Dallas area. You've covered SMU for a while. How much did Garrett Riley have an effect on on Walker's decision, in your opinion? Garrett Riley, obviously the offensive coordinator for TCU, who was hired by Clemson. You know, I, I feel like if, if the Garrett Riley news would have broken a little bit later, maybe TCU would have had Walker on campus already and, and get, been able to get him on board. Um, that could have had an impact. But in the end, I, I don't think that necessarily had too big of an impact. You know, Sonny Dykes has his imprint on that offense, and, and he did so at SMU. He did so under multiple offensive coordinators, you know, making it look a little bit more air raid than maybe um, Garrett Riley or even, you know, Rhett Lashley, who was his OC uh, the first time around at SMU, probably wanted it to. So yeah. I feel like the offense and the offensive scheme with, with Sonny Dykes is always going to be, you know, pretty explosive for a quarterback um, as long as he has that, that guy. Um, and he's pretty good at finding him. Uh, they'll be able to run and uh, run run the score up a good bit and and put points on the board. So I don't necessarily think the offensive coordinator was was that um, big of a deal. I I don't think Garrett Riley and Walker had too much of a relationship dating back to recruiting either. So if that would have been the case, and it would have been a situation where um, he, you know they were heavily involved or something like that, then maybe it would have impacted uh, him a little bit more. But I I don't think in the end that that had too much of an impact just from reading the tea leaves. Do you expect Spencer Sanders to transfer to Ole Miss? Like a lot of the news is, is, is kind of trending that he is. I, I'm not close enough to it to, to really know for sure, or, or give you, you know, my best guess, but it, it seems like there's a lot of smoke around, you know, Ole Miss wanting to add another quarterback, even after adding Walker Howard. So um, with these quarterback dominoes, it, it nothing really surprises me anymore, quite honestly. Um, so I, I think, you know, Lane Kiffin likes to stockpile those guys and, you know, after getting a contract, uh, extension and a, and a hefty one over the off season, he's going to try to add whoever he thinks can, can help them take that next step, uh, you know, up in, in the SEC West. Billy, we've seen Kiffin turn water into wine with quarterbacks, whether it's Blake Sims or Jacob Coker or even AJ McCarron, uh, to a degree. What is his reputation within those circles, within recruiting circles, when Lane Kiffin shows up to a quarterback school? Does he have that type of cachet? I think he does. Uh, you, you look around the country and, and you try to find, well, who, who are the quarterback whispers? Who are the quarterback developers? And, you know, I mean, people bring up Jimbo Fisher, but quite frankly, I don't think his recent track record shows that he is that anymore. And, and certainly his offense has backed that up. Um, but he's talked about Lincoln Riley certainly talked about, 
And then you go from there and, and you're trying to think about, well, who's next? Who's next? Um, I mean, Oklahoma State would be one that has, you know, had highly productive quarterbacks. But from there, uh, Ohio State is one that stands out to me. And then it's probably Lane Kiffin, uh, in my mind, at least. I mean, he's just been able to take so many different styles of quarterbacks and make them productive. Um, I'm not so sure uh, we've seen the success from his quarterbacks in the league um, because, in part, he's been able to, like you said, kind of turn water into wine. Uh, hasn't really had too many that have been at such a high level uh, that they've been able to sustain that type of success they saw under Lane Kiffin in the NFL. So I'll be interested to see what happens with Jackson Dart. Uh, Matt Corral, obviously one that that stands out recently as far as, you know, can he sustain that even though he was a highly touted guy? Um, but, you know, I think he, in terms of college football offenses, whoever he plugs in at, court, at quarterback, it seems to do pretty well for him. Um, any expectations on National Signing Day here, the second go-round splash for LSU? I, I think the only one we're tracking right now, and, and, you know, there could be somebody that pops up late. You know, they're doing their due diligence, seeing if, you know, somebody didn't sign early. Um, why not, you know, can LSU get them on campus for an official visit? Can they, you know, fight their way into a recruitment? We'll see uh, on some of those guys. But the main one we're, we're tracking right now is Jamel Howard, uh, the big defensive tackle out of Chicago. Uh, he was, you know, a long considered a, a Michigan lean. He was a former Wisconsin commit that, you know, when the coaching change there happened, backed off that commitment. Uh, he's all of 6'3", 320. So he's a big boy in the middle, and that's what LSU needs. Uh, LSU, Ole Miss, um, I believe uh, Illinois hosted him last uh, weekend. Ole Miss is supposed to host him the weekend before National Signing Day. LSU is is trending towards getting that visit. They're expected to get him on campus here, um, you know, this weekend. So if he does show up, you can put LSU squarely on his list as far as finalists and and schools that are in the mix for him. You know, they're trying to get in there because they do need uh, one more defensive lineman, and and this would be one that you know you can kind of allow to develop. Uh, you can get him on track with the strength and conditioning program and and see uh, where he goes from there. But uh, there are a lot of schools circling him late and trying to get him on campus for official visits, and LSU's certainly one of them. He's the kind of the one player, I would say, that we're, we're tracking right now uh, for LSU. Uh, Bill, we had a caller here a couple of minutes ago with a recruiting question specific down here in southwest Louisiana. Dominic McKinley out of Acadiana picked up an Alabama offer earlier this week. It looks like he's been on a tear here the last couple of weeks picking up Schools like Baylor and Florida State. Where's LSU sit with the Acadiana six foot seven defensive tackle? Yeah, I just watched his uh, junior tape again, and and I mean, really impressive. He just actually added a Michigan State offer as well uh, last night. So uh, Mel Tucker likes what he sees up there. I feel like he's somebody that LSU is going to have to t- pay attention to in state, um, just from watching the tape. I mean, somebody that uh, is a playmaker. He had a couple interceptions, you know, right off the bat. Um, so reads the play well, uh, you know, makes yard, uh, took it for yards after the interception and, and, and got a return out of it, which is impressive, uh, especially in the situations that he caught the football in. I, I feel like when it comes to, uh, you know, the defensive line, Jamar Kane did, did a terrific job on the edge positions. Obviously, it was kind of a tough cookie to eat with Deron Reed going elsewhere in 2023 as far as defensive tackles go. Uh, but they retooled with the transfer portal. There's not as much necessarily pressure. Um, to, you know, load up with, you know, let's say three big defensive tackles that are all, um, you know, highly touted across the country now. One of the guys that I would, you know, think LSU gives a hard look to uh, is Dominic McKinley. Uh, Just looking at his junior tape, I mean, you look in state and there's Westgate's Demirian Johnson. uh, There's LCA's uh, Melvin Hills. Those guys have been on the radar for a long time. There are also players, though, that are worth, you know, seeing how they look in the spring. Melvin Hills was coming off the torn ACL going into his junior year um, and performed, you know, well, I would say, you know, got them back to state championship. He's somebody that I still think, you know, maybe you bring him back to camp. Um, Demiree Johnson has a lot of buzz around him. He's certainly somebody they're pushing for. They're pushing for both, I would say, but you want to see how they develop. Dominic McKinley, somebody they got to go see and, and certainly pay a little bit more attention to you know, really think about offering uh, just by watching the tape, you know, who knows kind of what 
his whole situation is, but um, you know, he's very, very productive on the tape and, and schools are recognizing that and uh, that size. He looks like a trim uh, six, seven, two eighty. If, if that two eighty is yeah. legit. So um, when it comes to guys like that, they're hard to find. Uh, there's not many avatars uh, at defensive tackle running around every year. And, and if one's in your backyard, you certainly got to pay attention. Uh, Billy, what about Fitzgerald West with, the need for interior defensive linemen and the transformation that the offensive line seems to be going through with recruiting in the program right now. Uh, does he still fit at center or do they like what they saw from him at defensive tackle just out of a necessity late last year? You know, I, I feel like if, if you're Fitzgerald West, you're probably better suited uh, to play defensive tackle uh, in the SEC. You do have some some tools you can use and get under guys and, and, and use that leverage a little bit better because he's not, you know, one of those powering guys. Um, as far as the offensive line goes, I think he's somebody that at this point, you know, with what they have coming in, especially, and, and they certainly were going after a center and Jake Redfro, uh, who ended up going to Wisconsin, you know, he's probably out of the mix to, at center. You know, he could be somebody that turns into something long-term, but when you just brought in DJ Chester, Paul Mabenga is a guy they're really, really high on. Um, he, he's, you know, that those are two guys right off the bat just in the signing class that uh, he's going to have to fight through, and that doesn't count who's coming back on the roster next year already. So um, I feel like you got to make the flip to defensive tackle full-time. It gives them the best chance to get on the field. I liked what I saw uh, in the in the bowl game against Purdue uh, from the snaps that he got, but, um, you know, he's somebody that needs to continue to develop that explosiveness because – uh, you know, Jamar Cain will find those guys that have that twitch uh, in the middle there, and and they certainly have two good ones coming back, and Mason Smith and Makai Wingo that he's got to battle through. Um, so it's it's a, kind of an uphill battle for him either way in a way. It seems like John Emery's going to come back. What does that mean for LSU's offense? What does it mean for the running back room? Yeah, I, I think for the running back room, you know, I, I think I talked about this uh, on, uh, on another one of your shows. Um, running back was a position that I kind of pegged as – somewhere where I would have addressed uh, with the transfer portal, you know, found some, somebody who's kind of that home run threat. Uh, but with John Emery coming back, I mean, that's big, you know, this is still somebody that has plenty of talent. Uh, he, you know, has always just not been able to piece it all together, whether it's, you know, a fumble here or there, or um, whether it was some of the off the field stuff, you know, earlier in his career, he's not lived up to the expectations. He's coming back for another season to, you know, give it a go. Um, my bold prediction last year was John Emery, uh, you know, topping a thousand yards. You know, this year I'm kind of thinking maybe maybe it's the same one. Um, just early on, if he is in fact returning, which we're expecting him to, he he just brings that veteran presence and and I feel like you know he has that talent to consistently give them you know positive yardage and and not necessarily um, hold back that running back room. It's a it's a room that has you know, kind of some 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 grinders, uh, Josh Williams, Noah Kane, uh, those type of players. And you add John Emery, another, you know, big back, uh, he's, he's going to be able to factor in and, and certainly, uh, help them. I, I just think you're right now, you're kind of missing that explosiveness, um, in that whole room. So, uh, they really need consistent consistency and, um, you know, being able to hold on to the football. That's been John's issue, you know, at times. So if he cleans that up, um, you know, puts together a strong year, could find himself getting drafted, but, um, you know, he needs to, he needs to kind of get himself right for this one year. It's a one year job interview and, uh, then go from there. Brandon Hollingsworth, hashtag ask Billy. Billy, what's the deal with Kyron Buddha, six foot three, 300 pound defensive tackle for 2023 out of St. Aug? Hollingsworth says he's at a position of need for LSU and he's in their backyard. Where's the status? Yeah, I, I, we, he's one of those prospects that you hear a ton about throughout a recruiting cycle, um, but, but not too much from LSU sources as far as um, them going after him. I, I feel like as far as in-state goes in 2023, they feel like they've evaluated the, the state well and, and you know they don't necessarily feel like they, they want to reach on on a player just to take a player because they're from Louisiana um, I, I think they showed that at multiple multiple positions this cycle you look at safety you know they're they're kind of still poking around on a transfer safety uh, they could have probably had somebody like a macho Stevenson or a um, Carl Williams or 
um, our Javius Moss in the 2023 class, all legit safety options. Um, and, and they, you know, didn't move on them. They trusted their evals. Ashley Williams, an edge prospect out of Zachary, they didn't move on them. Uh, so I think they've, they've, you know, looked at the 2023 class in Louisiana in depth. You know, they, they found some guys like a Dylan Carpenter uh, that they loved uh, and got him on board here, you know, right before uh, the early signing period. But that was kind of it. And I feel like at this stage, if they haven't moved on him, I don't think they're going to. And I don't necessarily feel like it's, it's a prospect that uh, they should move on. Uh, you know, the tough thing about recruiting Louisiana guys is, you know, they, in a way they love LSU and if you miss on them, they want to stay and they want to stick around and they want to, you know, wear the purple and gold. Um, so if you miss you, you better find somebody that can, you're, you're sure is going to help you um, in some way down the line. And uh, that, I think that's what it comes down to is that, you know, at this point they don't see him like that. So, um, you know, I think he added an Arizona state offer, uh, in the last couple of weeks uh, with that new coaching staff. And um, that's a that's a program that has some ties with uh, Kyron's defensive line coach, uh, Edge Assassins. And it uh, wouldn't shock me if he ended up there. But you know, quite honestly, I was a little surprised he didn't sign early with some, some program. Last one, Bill, get you out of here. Uh, LSU basketball is struggling mightily right now. They dripped, uh, dropped their fifth straight SEC game last night. Um, what do you make of where McMahon has this program right now heading into another conference Saturday? Yeah, it, it's tough. I mean, look, Auburn is, is such a tough matchup. They got it, I think, in the uh, – it was like 34-32 or something. Yep. Um, could be wrong, but um, they got it to that point, and then Auburn just, you know, quite frankly, did what Auburn Auburn does, which is you know take care of business. They're a good basketball team. Uh, they always have uh, an elite – level of talent on their roster. I think that's kind of what it comes down to a little bit uh, with this 20, uh, with, with this season's roster for LSU. They just don't have uh, an elite roster and it shows in some of these games against the elite of the SEC, Alabama, Auburn. Um, it's, it's wild uh, that we look back and Arkansas was, you know, feels like so long ago now after uh, the run that they've been on. Uh, with, with five straight conference losses, you know, they, they don't have somebody that can shoot the ball at a high level from beyond the arc. I mean, another, you know, poor shooting effort um, from them against Auburn. So I, I don't necessarily know if it's a situation where it can be fixed this season. Um, and, and they got to find a way though, to, to write the ship and, and, you know, find a way to, to get more movement and, you know, out of the, out of the offense and improve movement. Uh, they're they're not you know doing a good job sharing the ball uh, very few assists it's it's just kind of in a bad place right now so they got to kind of circle the wagons and uh, find a way to uh, at the very least you know get some offense going get something positive um, you know our our buddy Will Wade always said you know it's easier to get guys to play defense when it's uh, going well on offense so um, they've got to find a way to do that it, it's uh, the offense right now doesn't have somebody they can truly rely on at a high level, especially shooting the ball. And um, I think that's hurting, you know, some of the team's confidence too. Billy Embody from on three, you can follow them at on three sports or follow him directly at Billy Embody covering LSU recruiting at Bengal Tigers on three. Got a great podcast alongside our friend Shay Dixon that you can catch up with, uh, with recruiting as well. Thank you, Billy. We'll talk again soon. Thanks a lot, Jordy. Appreciate it. All right, buddy. There he is. Uh, Katie's restaurant down in new Orleans. Remember Katie's Restaurant, next time you're down in the Big Easy and you want to look for a little taste of the town, katiesinmidcity.com is where you can find the menu. Great menu over there, Scott Craig and the crew, man. Uh, lots to choose from over at, uh, at Katie's in Mid City, Katie's Restaurant. You can find them uh, really easily on, uh, online. And then, of course, 3701 Iberville Street, right there in Mid City. In the heart of it, great neighborhood place to catch a a beer and a burger any day that you're down there. Uh, get a a little bit of a feel for the environment, a feel for the neighborhood. Uh, Katie's has been around since 1984. Katie's in MidCity.com. Scott Craig, great friend of ours, great friend of our show, and uh, 